So, so maybe continuing in this vein of you know, trying to kind of unpack what we mean by some of our favorite phrases, um, the other one that comes to my mind is individualized instruction. And again, I think this is tied to the idea of you know, if we do diagnostic or formative assessment, we have a sense of where children are. And let's stipulate we've got a curriculum that gives us a set of ideas of mm -hmm. here, here are activities that would help children take that next step. But if we've got a classroom of 20 kids, um, how do we structure groups of kids, time, um, a teacher aid, so that you can actually um, match kids or small groups of kids with the activities that are actually appropriate for them. Right. I think that's really one of the biggest um, challenges. Is, and we've said it all, you know, we've said it for years. I mean, it went way back in Head Start that we said, you know, individualizing was a goal. Um, and it's a part of developmentally appropriate practice that, you know, you pay attention to what's not just generally predictable about children, but what's individually appropriate for them. Right. Um, obviously, in order to teach, you have to know the children. You have to get to know them and you have to build a relationship with them. But because we have a basis of understanding in what we understand about child development, there are predictions that we can make about them and, and getting to know, you know, the cultural context within which children are growing enables you to, to, to do some predicting. So the fact is that you have those predictions and once you get to know children, you can you can make some um, assumptions about where they whether or not those predictions are accurate how they fit within the, the predictions and that's where assessment comes in as well if it's more structured um, I think that there is a scary concept I mean individualization is scary because it sounds like you're going to have 20 IEPs or something and that's not what it means um, even though some people will think that um, I think that's overwhelming for teachers and not necessary um, I think the idea is that you do identify where children are, perhaps in a, you know, when you have a continuum it's a, or a particular learning goal, it's likely that some children will be near that goal, some children will be behind, be behind it, and some children will be advanced and be up above it. So you can sort of think in terms of, of where children generally are in relationship, you know, to what you're trying to achieve with them. And that's where small groups come in, that's where groups come in that are related, where children are similar in, in their abilities, and then you have other groupings where children are at different levels so that they can support one another. So it isn't just the teacher who's the resource to children, because language is a really great example. You know, if you only grouped children who were whose language was at a lower level together, you would never get any progress on language development. They have to speak with more accomplished peers in terms of promoting their greater um, vocabulary development and com complexity of language. So you would you want to do multiple kinds of grouping throughout the day. You probably want to have children engage in at least two small groups, maybe more, but at least two small groups during a five-day period so that they have um, you know, so that they have that opportunity for you to really target in on what they're capable of doing and, and where they are. I mean, preferably, you always have a period of time in the day where children engage in small groups. But because you only have the two adults, what would happen would be one adult, perhaps the teacher, would be with a group that she's really supporting with gr more intentional behaviors. Another group with an assistant would be in a situation where the children perhaps are, you know, more engaged in, um, in an activity that, like a math game or something like that, that could be more structured. And then the other children could be engaged in a project that's much more um, self-initiated during that small group period. So there are ways to individualize during groups to get to a group that's potentially more like six or seven children, yep. you know, than ten children. Right. But you really don't have to think of every child having that individual plan. It's more of a general plan that you, you know, the general plan and then what you adapt to the individual children is the teaching strategy. It's the conversation you're having with the child, you know, it's the particular um, way you're reading a you know, book that you choose to read with a group of children that may be a much more 
advanced book or whatever the questions you asked? Right. So I think small, to me, small groups are a key that comes through, which I think is, a, yeah. is certainly something you can plan for within a day and a weekly schedule. You have to plan sense. for it because um, it, it, it takes a structure. And, and the interesting thing about it is that, you know, children are really smart. You know, we underestimate them, obviously, at times. But they will pretty quickly get the routines of, of a day. And so they can get a small group routine, too. Um, we, you know, we, have, we make assumptions that it's the teacher's responsibility to control the class. And so teachers are so worried about, you know, getting to small group. They're afraid of what's going to happen to the rest of the children and all this sort of thing. And it's like so many other things. You know, children don't walk in the door knowing how to function in small groups, but you scaffold that. <laughs> you know, you, you, over time, you develop their abilities to do that in a structured way, and they, they are certainly capable of doing it, just like they're capable of um, using all the routines of a classroom day. Yep. 